So one forecast I think Jim has made clear is likely in neuroscience that 10 years from now we'll know that most of what we now know is very limited and probably much of it wrong. So given that we're looking at an inherent uncertainty in neuroscience and how neuroscience is going to change who we are. The keys we have as futurists is to address uncertainty in a very systematic way. So we will take forecasts or scenarios and create what you might think of as a probability space. And then we divide that space, which we'll do now in a playful way in neurosciences, into what's expectable. So if I tell you that it's expectable what we've been seeing and thinking about, that our technologies that are those that are in the computer realm uh, are going to merge with us in ways where our brains are going to be the point of interface. And so we know, for example, paralyzed people have had neural implants of chips and they can think and move a computer cursor and therefore have a new way of actually moving in the world. And you may know that Stephen Hawking has been communicating with people through a voice synthesizer that he controls through his facial muscles. But his disease is degeneratively progressing so he will lose control of his facial muscles. So he's gone to a neuroscientist and asked, can you help me devise a way so I can communicate just through thinking? And the answer is yes. And so this is something that is likely he will have. And we know that a lab at Duke is planning to have in the World's Cup down in Brazil a paralyzed teenager come out at the beginning of the game with an exoskeleton that he is controlling the neural implants and kicking the opening kick. So already we can see that you know, our way now in which we can go through our sound, through our sight, into the world of what computers can connect us to, is moving to a new way in which we're crossing the boundaries between what's biological, what's physical, what's in the neurosciences, what's in the computer sciences, what's man and what's machine. And so we're having new ways of combining those and is there anybody here who thinks it's unlikely that over the next 10, 20 years we won't be more intimately connected with our capacity and that what McLuhan told us decades ago that first we shape our, our tools and thereafter they shape us, that we're going to be reshaped just as you, know, you just think about how our everyday patterns of work have been reshaped by this thing that Star Trek told us was coming decades ago, but now it's here. Anybody think that's an unlikely or unexpectable forecast? Okay, good. That seems to be that we've got you in the first, what we'll call the zone of expectation. Now, most people think that the most likely forecasts and scenarios are in this zone of the expectable. I actually think that those are not the most likely, which is one of the reasons why we always say you have to work also in another zone that we'll call the zone of growing desperation. Now, this is the fun one, yeah. You know, because we can imagine just as you think about how George Orwell in 1948 saw the television, saw the totalitarian government in the Soviet Union and put those together, inverse the years, and gave us 1984, where the kind of two-way relationship we have with computers and television today, he imagined that under the control 
of the state. And so we have to start to think, if we're having the neurosciences bringing our interfaces inside of us, what about the kinds of fears of mind control? I mean, how many of you think we're overly influenced by our political ads today? Or that our buying and consuming patterns are overly influenced by corporate messaging to consume? Well, what about if they're really inside your head? So who is going to actually have control of the technology? And on your slide, when you looked at how neurosciences is used, it didn't have by business and for profits, but is there anybody that thinks that won't happen? So the potential here for technologies to be used in ways that begin to change who we are, our independence, interdependence, are one of the kinds of ethical questions that I think Jim is inviting us to ask. But we have to recognize that really these images that were very artfully portrayed by people like uh, the uh, Aldous Huxley in Brave New World or George Orwell in 1984 have to be, as all images from artists should be, seen as a guide to what science can bring. Artists see what scientists later think. And so the warnings from artists that we could go there, do not go there, need to be taken seriously, which is why it's always important as futurists to work in the zone of growing desperation. And it's the dark side projected forward. On the other hand, those are the easy and surprisingly fun kinds of futures to do. In fact, when I have groups, if I were to divide you into groups and have some of you working in the expectable future, which is methodologically so important, especially for people for whom the future is strange and unapproachable, you need that set of forecasters, scenarios, and what's expectable to get them to be able to see the other possibilities where do you think, if I have that group, and then I have another group in the zone of growing aspiration, showing what we should fear from the neurosciences in this blend of human and machine? Where's the laughter going to be? In the expectable futures room or in the desperate futures? It's always in the desperate future. And people can do that. And it turns out psychologists show us that bad is stronger than good in our minds. And there's an even an argument that that's important from an evolutionary standpoint. If, if I were designing you as a, let's say, a simple fish, and I was going to put a stimulus for bad, predator, and a stimulus for good, food, it's very important that I make the stimulus for bad stronger. Because you can pass by that meal, and you'll find another meal. You try to pass by that predator, Bye, you're out of the gene pool. So it turns out that similarly as we think about the future, we tend to magnify what we fear and under explore and recognize what we most hope for. So that's why it's important to go to the zone of high aspiration. Now in this zone, one can see the surprising successes. So what would be the most surprising successes if we were to take the cap capacities promised from neuroscience? We were to apply them with a kind of knowledge of psychology. And I'll contend what we could forecast is a world where we're using our technologies to create remarkable environments for all children to develop to their fullest potential. And that is the emotional intelligence that has been focused on. And it turns out that uh, the emotional brain, the limbic system, emerges and develops before the cognitive brain. And so if we look at what's happening in healthcare now, it's shifting to health. And we're recognizing that our social health is actually much more vital than we've been dealing with. We've been spending so much time on our physical health, but what they call the social determinants of health. 
Do you feel accepted and supported? Are you treated with respect and love? And there are even studies now that look at what they call the gen of a place. Uh, it's a Chinese word. And so when you walk through a place, do you come out feeling better about who you are or worse? And there, this can be measured. There are studies that show that you can articulate that. So social health is now emerging out of this understanding of the emotional intelligence that psychologists have had. Now, cognitive comes and you think about how the neurological understanding of how learning can be accelerated as we get our new scans and we'll probably within a decade or two be walking around with helmets that can have scanners. Arthur C. Clarke in 3001 had a brain cap that you basically will shave our heads, we'll wear this, it looks like a, uh, a bathing cap that you put on your head and it's growing dendrites down in and so we're creating interfaces with the neural networks that are able to communicate via electronic and computerized networks so that we could share vacations. We can be in our own movies. We can dream ways that are much more real than any movie you see today. So this notion of the emergence starts to say, well, what about learning? Can you cognitively take everything in the Wikipedia and download it. So you don't have to go online to do this. So how is learning and cognitive development going to change? But in the zone of high aspiration, I think perhaps the best articulation of what the neurosciences can help bring us as it creates these environments for all to flourish is actually described by George Valent in Spiritual Evolution. Now George Valent has done, uh, now he's an emeritus professor of psychiatry at Harvard, but he got a hold and ran the adult development studies that began in 1937. And these were prospective, lifelong studies of people to understand what goes into success. What are the keys to a successful, thriving human being? And he was able to see this all the way through life. And I think he has the answers. And it, in his final book, Spiritual Evolution, he says the answer is the positive emotions. And that this isn't just emotional intelligence, but it is actually a spiritual intelligence that just as we can, through the neurosciences and creating environments, develop the emotional and cognitive intelligence, we can also develop the spiritual intelligence. And furthermore, he contends that evolution is no longer simply a biological process. It is a cultural process and that the fulcrum through which it occurs is these positive emotions of love, joy, faith, and awe. So as he describes how the neuroscience teaches us about faith, for example, it turns out, how many of you have ever had an infant yeah, and when the infant cried, you'd get up and you'd pick up the infant and you'd make those noises that cognitively make no sense at all, but emotionally are saying, you're safe, you're loved, you care for that infant. And every time you picked up that in infant, you know what you were teaching? You were teaching the emotional brain what will mature to become faith. It matures into, at one stage of life, religious faith. At later stages, it can go into the faith that we are going to in continue as a species and that the next generations can go beyond what we have. And so I'll contend that what the neurosciences are bringing us are a capacity to create new generations strengthened in all the positive emotions so that they can develop emotionally, cognitively, and spiritually beyond what we've become. And that is the highest ethic that I can see neuroscience achieving in the decades to come. Thank you.